Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today, we're going to take a look at the climate crisis and what can be done to provide leadership to help us to cope with this particular problem. I guess today is an expert in this area. Dr. Jonathan Gosling is Emeritus Professor of Leadership Studies at the University of Exeter, having been chair and director of the Center for Leadership Studies there for 12 years. He is an international expert on leadership formation, sustainable development, and many other critical issues. Dr. Gosling recently contributed to a major environmental crisis publication titled Deep Adaptation, Navigating the Realities of Climate Chaos. Dr. Jonathan Gosling, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you very much, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate you being with me. Thank you so very much. Well, first off, let me ask you, how did you decide to be involved in contributing to this uh, book titled Deep Adaptation, Navigating the Realities of Climate Chaos. Well, Bill, some time ago, I was looking at the significant amount of writing that was beginning to be done and, 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 and proper social science research into how uh, organizations, companies, uh, uh, government departments and humanitarian, humanitarian agencies would cope with the likely increase in pressure, the decrease in financial resources, uh, growing migration and so on, the, the, the foreseeable results of uh, a more environmentally challenged uh, sort of planetary system. And uh, I guess if you, one way to describe this is if you were to plot the likely results of this foreseeable rise in temperatures and decline in biodiversity, that you could plot the, on, a, on a normal distribution curve, which has a sort of bell shape like that. And right in the middle of where the sort of bulk of the probability are, the most likely outcomes, you get a range of sort of from moderate to pretty severe effects. But at either end of that distribution curve of likely outcomes, you have, let's say, 5% each end of these, of these curves. 5% of the probability is that nothing much will change. We'll adapt pretty well and we'll be OK. And generally speaking, I found that I myself and many other people tend to give a lot of credence, in, not in intellectually, but in our day to day life. For example, I find myself worrying about whether my pension is going to continue to give a good return 25, 30 years out from now. Although intellectually, I know that, that the economy is going to be really challenged in that kind of time scale. But I'm still planning for it as if it's a continuation of today's conditions. Now, on the other end of that probability curve, you have a 5% chance that things will be very disturbed indeed, so much so that there will be a collapse in the uh, recognizable ways in which the, the, the world economy and social institutions uh, are established and work at the moment. So when I started, I thought it's a proper intellectual discipline to give some attention to that outer 5% the 5% of major effects, 5% of probability. It seems like, and I'm not a climate specialist, but it seems like we're moving in that direction. And of course, you're, the title of that book is leads me to think that we're, we're maybe moving into a chaotic, -y, panic -y situation. And in the title also, you had deep adaptation as opposed to adaptation. Uh, how do you tie those concepts I just mentioned together? What's the difference between deep adaptation, adaptation, and a chaotic situation? Yeah, well, I, I think for many people in the world now, they're already in a in a very panicky and chaotic situation. Their their, their livelihoods are destroyed. Their land is becoming drought ridden or flood flooded, and and so on. So, so this is not a kind of future. A, a prognosis. This, this is the lives of many people and many more people each year. And, uh, and in those contexts, when we talked about adapting to the change, 
you're kind of stretching the meaning of the term adaptation. Uh, when I think about myself adapting to changing conditions, I think, well, I'll probably be able to carry on more or less recognizably the same, uh, live in my house and my neighborhood with my community. I'll be able to count on uh, institutions of, of the police, of schools and so on, continuing one way or another, but we'll adapt a bit. Um, but, but the experience of people whose societies and, and agriculture and their economies are falling apart is that's beyond adaptation. That's a collapse. So the term deep adaptation really refers to, OK, how does one adapt to collapse? And uh, the, the, the authors of the book are really from a number of different disciplines trying to get themselves, discipline themselves to think about that category of situation. As we all must do, yes. And your chapter is on leadership and management in context of deep adaptation. I'm just curious, uh, there was a couple, there were some terms you used, we've already talked about adaptation, but in times of collapse, how do we deal with uh, denial and salvation as to help us to get through this particular problem. So, so what I've, I, I've really tried to do in that chapter, Bill, is to uh, pull together the experience from many different circumstances of impending near collapse and actual collapse, what we know from all around the world, and see what kinds of leadership gets credence with people in those circumstances. And, and we see that people tend to follow, particularly early on, leaders who offer a, 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 a possibility to deny the impending reality of what's coming at them. Uh, they offer credence to leaders who seem to be offering uh, a solution that might, as it were, save them from this, this predicament, this impending disaster. Uh, and and th those and I've called these leaders of denial and leaders of salvation. And I don't want to be derogatory about that because to some extent, in order to carry on functioning and to focus on the things we can do, we do psychologically and pragmatically need to kind of put aside to deny something of the enormity of the situation. And also we, we do need to look to technologies to uh, behaviors that might, in a way, save us from the worst of this. However, uh, a kind of extreme denial and extreme salv salvation is really rather counterproductive to the very important work of recognizing reality, coming to terms with it, understanding that we're going to have to find the resources within ourselves. And that's where the roots for adaptation really are, are embedded. So in that chapter, I've distinguished between those three offers from leadership, denial, salvation, and adaptation. Adaptation, right. Now, right now, the leaders of the world literally are en route to Glasgow, Scotland, for the United Nations major conference on the environment. And of course, we think back to 2015, I guess it was, when the Paris Climate Accords were adopted. That was a, mo a monumental move on, the, well, oh, I guess about 194, 196 countries of the world to agree to that, but it's still, it was a very flexible set of goals. It didn't require the countries to do certain things. Now in Glasgow, apparently, they're saying that we're moving so much faster than we thought as far as the temperature increase, and that uh, that is posing a major problem, that they've got to make hard decisions on what they're going to do to meet these targets and to reduce our carbon footprint and make sure that we are not going to exceed a higher temperature, which will heat the globe even faster. As you look into your writings and just look into your crystal ball, I guess, what would you recommend and what do you hope uh, three weeks from now when, or two weeks from now when this conference is over, what do you hope that these leaders have come up with and adopted that will help us to get better control of this climate crisis? 
so I, I guess my hopes are at the most optimistic end uh, so that some very practical commitments are made and that these are translated quickly into trade agreements and legislative frameworks so that the, the rules of the game are shifted for companies and for citizens around the world so that we know really what the game is and, and a competition is open and fair within those rules. And that includes rules around energy, energy, energy generation, energy source, around trading, around carbon sequestration, around uh, emissions targets, carbon budgets, uh, and also around how we account for social capital and natural capital along with economic capital in our economic activities, our, our business activities. And these are all doable, the, the, the means for doing them are there, the technologies are there or nearly there. And it, it really needs that the framework's being done. And, and, and I do think this is feasible. Uh, do I think it's likely? Uh, I, I probably veer on the uh, pessimistic end of the scale on that, but I'd love to be proved wrong in that way. But, it, but if I might push a bit further, Bill, the, the, there's another sense of, uh, of outcomes that I would really hope for from COP26, and that is that uh, the, the discourse amongst these world leaders serves to create a sense of, um, a sense of legitimacy in their, their decision making, their reference to science, their appreciation of you know, both the, 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 the fundamental basis of science and an understanding of how science emerges and changes, differs over time, so that we, we, we shift away from a, a rather simplistic uh, dichotomy between sort of faith and science into something where we, we understand that science is dealing with a constantly emerging, changing understanding and that dis political decision makers are seen to be the legitimate holders of proper thinking about the, the trade-offs that have to be made. Um, I, I really hope we can do this because I think that will model for us the leadership of adaptation rather than denial or salvation. And I guess it's an old cliche to say this is where the rubber hits the road and they have got to make hard decisions because if they don't, we will not achieve our goals and we just can't have vague goals that are unenforceable and they're out there. Maybe we'll get to them. Maybe we won't. But you're absolutely right. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with the PBS or Community Access Television Station, or perhaps you have a podcast, or you're with an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a computer, you like our shows and you would like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided as a public service at no cost to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're taking a look at the climate crisis and how important it is that we get a handle on this and try to at least slow it down, if not reverse it. My guest is an expert on this area. Dr. Jonathan Gosling is Emeritus Professor of Leadership Studies at the University of Exeter, having been Chair and Director of the Center for Leadership Studies there for 12 years. Dr. Gosling recently contributed to a major environmental crisis publication titled Deep Adaptation, Navigating the Realities of Climate Chaos. We were talking a moment ago about the, the importance of the Glasgow Conference, and we won't know the results of that for about two weeks now, I guess, or maybe as we go along, we might learn a little more, more about it. But there have been so many key entities who have been involved in helping to promote this discussion of climate change. And of course, the UN has been one of the main drivers of this whole discussion through the establishment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change through going back, uh, well, back many decades, but in particular to 1992 with the UNSAID conference, the UN conference 
on environment and development in Rio de Janeiro and on up to the present day. You participated in the Rio Plus 20 conference, I guess in 2012, and represented uh, several institutions in the U UK. What was the, uh, well, first off, how do you view the role of the UN? And then what was the, the thrust of that particular conference and some of the major recommendations that came out of it? Well, I think uh, to answer your, your general question, uh, I, I think the UN is a, a desperately needed and necessary set of institutions. Uh, I can't imagine how we would have, have any means to make the decisions and the, and, the, and the standards that are needed without it, in spite of all the frustrations and the justifiable claims that it's become, in many cases, a talking shop that acts too late, if at all. Uh, but, but nonetheless, talking is the way in which we tell ourselves the new stories about and the new sense of what matters and what counts, and it, it, this is the basis for doing it. The Rio Plus 20 uh, meeting in 2012, as you say, was, well, it's where the term sustainable development goals really emerged and became established. Uh, and that fed into the 2015 Paris Accord. So it was the it was the foundation, I guess, one of the one of the significant foundations for the Paris Accord. Uh, a lot of money, 500 over 500 billion dollars, was promised to be spent on greening the economy one way or another. And it's hard to go back and account exactly as to uh, of the money that has been spent, what followed directly from those commitments. But I think it really did shift the uh, and made brought up into the surface. This is the language we're now speaking around sustainable development. Um, also, it was the first of the major conferences that had both the official uh, uh, state apparatus that had the major groups, and, and, and the major groups are made up of significant non-governmental interest groups. Uh, and I, I've been a, a member of the NGO major, major group, which pulls together and voices the interests of NGOs from all around the world. And there are others on forests and water and so on. Um, and at the meeting itself, there was a, a, a whole village of, uh, sort of civil society groups, a, a, a sort of, sh I don't know, a kind of parallel summit happening just in the same city, not too far away from where the main conference was, and a lot of delegates passed from one to another. So it re and it wasn't bogged down by protest, uh, but it was definitely challenged by protest. And so I think, uh, well, my experience was it was it was a, a very fertile opportunity to be challenged, to develop ideas, and to be, uh, in, in, in my own case, to be pushed to think further and, and, and be more demanding on myself and my constituents. And the, I was representing an organization that, that uh, deals with sustainability in UK higher education. Uh, and we met with our counterparts from other countries all around the world uh, and developed a number of very practical tools uh, that are, are now rolled out and being quite influential in education for sustainable development around the world. Uh, I, I mean, I'm a very small part in that, but there have been uh, a large number of actors. I think, it, you know, it, although the actual um, legislative commitments uh, basis was, was, was disappointing as always in these things, it, it, it has played a part in getting us to where we are now. And I think behind, you know, behind your question lie, lies a, a bigger question it is, is all of this good talk going to be enough? Will it, will it turn into action? And uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I, I fear not. I fear it's mm -hmm. too, 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 too slow, uh, too um, captured by particularly the fossil fuel companies. Uh, and other economic interests, uh, and the and the implications of transforming our economies and our societies are so enormous that even if we change for the good, it will feel like collapse to a lot of us, uh, and and we'll probably shy away from it. Yes, I, I think you're right. I think there's strong reason strong, many strong reasons for 
to be very skeptical as to what they're going to do because of the influence. You look at the fossil fuel money that's going in, well, just the US Congress, but into parliaments and other entities around the world to make sure that we keep pulling coal out of the ground, we keep using oil, we keep using gas, which is creating probably 90, 95% of our problem by doing this, but the moneyed interests are there and they have right now, it's estimated that there are $17 trillion of fossil fuels in the ground that these companies want to sell. And to be quite honest, uh, if you listen to the people who are talking to them, they're not concerned about planet earth or they're not concerned about what we think about it, but we do have to get this under control. Well, we're just about out of time and we've covered so many important issues. I'm curious, uh, just in the last minute or two of the things that we've talked about today, do you, are there any parting uh, messages you'd like to leave with our viewers as far as what we can do to try to uh, come together and to put aside our differences, break out of our tribes, stop listening to all this misinformation that's coming out about climate change is a hoax and that type of thing, which is not true, and to move forward and hopefully dealing with this uh, at least partially, if not totally. Well, well, you know the the the, the slogan of and the goals of the Extinction Rebellion is tell the truth and act as if you really believe it is true. And I, I think that's uh, that, that's a pretty good guide. You know? and, and my own experience has been that having faced the likelihood of very, very severe outcomes and got my, my, my mind and my heart sort of geared up, strengthened up to think about it and, and feel my way into it, uh, it's been very energizing and has uh, and has been a great guide to thinking about priorities priorities in my life more generally and uh, that's the experience of the deep adaptation forum if your viewers are interested they should google deep adaptation forum online and will find i think a very stimulating very humane conversations about the implications of recognizing the, the, the strong likelihood of very, very serious outcomes. And, and I think that's, you know, some people say, oh, that's very sad and very depressing. Well, it's sad, but it's also in a way reassuring that we can see the truth. We can think about these things without completely collapsing uh, in, in ourselves. It's, a, it's actually psychologically energizing, not as depressing as one might imagine. You know, and it's something we have to do because <laughs> we're we going to, have to do live with the aftermath of it, regardless of whether um, we accept it now or later. And that's what a lot of coastal cities like Miami, Florida, uh, New York City, coastal cities all around the world are saying that within 15, 20, 30 years, they're going to be underwater. They're all going to be the Venices of the Adriatic or the, of the Gulf of Mexico or wherever it is. But we have to deal with this. And of course, as you mentioned earlier, a critical player, even with its warts and imperfections, is the United Nations. As uh, Ambassador Madeleine Albright said, the U.S. or the U.N. is indispensable. It's not a perfect organization, but it's absolutely indispensable in helping us to deal with this problem and also other problems too, like moving jets, ships, mail, weather information around the globe. It, we live in an interdependent world, and we've got to work on these problems together. But Dr. Jonathan Gosling, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you very much, Bill. My pleasure. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.